Mm. How are you doing? Um, right. I hope you all know me. Uh, my name still remains Tets. <laughs> and I spell T A P S. So that's it is. And I'm standing in front of you today uh, to do a, one of the learning and discovery again. Uh, the topic is all about the formation of the Okavango Delta and also the history of the Okavango Delta and also the threats facing the Okavango Delta. And to add more again, uh, I'm going to talk about the engineers you know, or the, the engineers of the delta things like the keystone species of the Okavango delta mm. and lastly the interesting facts about the Okavango delta so i brought almost three maps here i'm going to use all the maps that i brought here one of the map is this one uh, which shows our country how it looks like you know the name of the country this is known as botswana the people living within the country they are known as botswana in the language spoken or the local language spoken within the country, it is Setswana. So it's Botswana, Botswana, Setswana. So it's more like rainy ways. And also English is one of our languages and it's our official language. So it is very, very important for kids at an early age to learn English. It's a must. It's not an optional subject, it's a must for them to learn English. Because nowadays, wherever you go around the world, people use English you know, in terms of communication. So it's so important for every kid in Botswana to learn English. You know, there are some other optional subjects. You know, talking about maybe French, if you want to do French, if you want to do German, it's an optional at school that you can do that. But I'm not, I'm not going to touch more into the languages and everything. So the size of the country, it is something like 581,730 square kilometers. The record in our country is similar or it's on the same size with France or Texas. I've never been to France, I've never been to Texas. But you folks, I think you have an idea about those uh, countries, you know, how big they are. Right. So that's what they reckon about uh, this beautiful small country. The population of people within the country, uh, we're talking about 2.2 million people. That was from the last census that were carried out around uh, 2011. And it came up with 2.2 million people within the country. So the reason again why I brought this map is just to show you some uh, some features around the map, you know, or the industries, our main industries around the map. I know folks who have done the history of Botswana back in Baba. I won't touch on deep onto the history of Botswana because already you have done it, you know. The reason why I brought it is to show you some few features around the map. Remember we have almost three industries, you know. The top one is diamonds and the second is tourism. The third is uh, beef, you know. But at first, it was I mean, it was diamonds, then beef, then tourism. At last, now what is some few years ago, tourism it has taken the second position. Now beef drops down, which means uh, our country is doing well in terms of tourism within uh, the country. I mean, yeah, tourism is doing well within uh, this country. So the, again, uh, the reason why I brought this map, I want to show you some features like uh, the population of people within this country and also things like uh, those national parks and game reserves within the country and some of the private concessions like uh, uh, an area like this, like quite a concession. So normally you get to see those concessions, they are more out of the, the private, I mean the, the national parks and game reserves. So within Botswana, if you look at these dark green things, like this ones here, these are national parks and game reserves within Botswana or the wildlife management areas, you know. And outside them, you get to find the small communities around them and also private concessions like Kwai. So our area, we are somewhere around this Okabongo Delta. So we are close to Moreni Game Reserve right in the middle of the Delta. And uh, our concession is out of the, out of the, uh, the Moreni the Game Reserve. So which means, the record of, oh, which means 34% of our country or the land within our country is the reserve for flora and fauna. Then the rest is the activities like mining and the uh, cities and towns. But 34% is, is reserved for animals and or wildlife in short, you know. Are, are y'all allowed to go into those uh, reserves? We can, we can, we are, we are allowed to go in. We can. They just, but, they just not off limits? Uh, no. Okay. Not really, yeah. Even uh, people in Chobe, a lot of people they go here. Remy came to close to us, we go there, but with us, our area, our, our, our camp, 
the reason why we don't go there, we, we look more into the animals. You know. uh, we still see the animals that people will see in modern medium itself. You know. Because those animals, again, in terms of movement, they keep on cruising to, this, the, uh, to the private area and to the, uh, to, uh, to the game itself there. So uh, now, <coughs> the population of people within the country, uh, we're talking about this area, which is the southeastern part of our country. There are some small villages up to the north of Botswana, but most of the people, they migrate, you know, in terms of seeking for employment and jobs to the towns and, uh, and uh, the cities around. So some of the, the villages are very, very small. Now the diamonds. Uh, our diamonds, we have almost two towns that produces almost those quality diamonds within the country. The first town is almost is somewhere in the south here. It is known as Joanain. So this is where we mine our diamonds. It's an open mining. And uh, we have another town known as Orapa, right in the middle of the country. So those are the two towns that we mine diamonds. I think folks, you know that uh, our diamonds is all about a joint venture between uh, one of the companies from Britain, uh, from Britain, known as DBS. And there's a joint venture between DBS and uh, Botswana government. So whatever is being extracted within our country, uh, it is shared amongst, um, it's shared equally between Botswana and DBS. So DBS is getting 50% and we're getting 50% of whatever the profit they make from the uh, extracting the diamonds. Beside the diamonds, we have the gold, Somewhere in Francistown, we have copper, nickel, and coal. Those are the other minerals. Some few, I mean, some uh, few years ago, they have discovered uranium in some parts of wow. Botswana. So probably some years to come, they will start to mine uh, uranium within our country. So, any questions before I take this map out? It was just to show you how our country looks like. So this is the Okavango Delta here, but we're still going to talk about the Delta. Happy. Right, I brought another map, folks. Uh, it shows uh, it's an African map, but it's not the whole map of Africa. We still have another map there. If you still want to see it later, you can uh, ask for it. We'll show it to you. There are some countries that are missing up here. Talking about those countries like Morocco, Tunisia. Some of the countries are missing up there. The reason why I brought this is all about uh, the drains are much bigger. That you guys, you guys, you will get to see them. So I'm gonna still point at our country. This is our country right in the middle. So we are a landlocked country. We don't have any access to the sea. You know, we're sharing the borders with almost four countries. Uh, to the south, we're sharing the borders with South Africa. Then to the north and northwest. I'm talking about this little protrusion here. It's part of Namibia. It is known as Capri Strip, Namibia. And uh, the whole of the country is on the western side of our country. And to the north, we have Zambia. East, we have Zimbabwe. You know, uh, we're sharing the borders with almost four countries. So, which means uh, we are trapped in the middle, and uh, it takes many of us as Botswana to go out, you know. And uh, most of us, we don't know the sea, and uh, we don't know the oceans around us. If I may tell, I give an example of myself. It takes many, it takes me many years, you know, to go out there, touch the waters from the sea, and try to drink, you know, and felt that the water is very, very salty. That was two years back. Uh, I did have an opportunity to go to Tanzania visit uh, Zanzibar Island and uh, that was the time I, I managed to try and drink the water from the sea and I felt oh the water is very very salty <laughs> so if, you if I talk of my mom I see it's my younger brother they've never been to uh, been out of this country they have been trapped in the middle you know. so nowadays some of Botswana that are living that went out uh, like students from our University of Botswana some of them they have chances to study abroad you know that's when they start to see these things. But most of the people around, they have never been seen, uh, they have never been uh, uh, to the sea or the oceans around. And also, again, for example, lots of Botswana folks, you are one of the luckiest people to come around, you know, to this pristine area, which is the Okabama Delta. If I talk of my cousins, all of my cousins, they don't know this area. They have never been to the Okabama Delta. I think uh, maybe his cousins too, they have never been to the, the Okabango Delta. So, so you are one of the likest people folks to visit this area. Most of the locals, they have never been to the area. They will ask me at home that, where are you working? I say at Okabango Delta, where is that area? You know, so this is <laughs> how it, it goes around, you know. So uh, even myself, I'm so lucky. I'm so proud of working within this Christian area. Always amazing, and I don't think I'll work anywhere until I get to tell or 
get to no, the 60s. You know, that's when I will get to uh, <laughs> head back home. I enjoy working around the, the Okavango Delta. Any questions? <laughs> All right, uh, folks. Uh, Folks, do people know how to swim? Do people here know how to swim? Uh, I'll say the the youth, you know, kids, yeah. children, yeah, youth, maybe from the age of maybe less than before, uh, below 30 years old. Those are the people who learn, uh, who knows how to swim. As myself, I'm lucky that the time when we were training uh, to be guides, we were also training, uh, trained how to swim. You know, so that's how I get to know how to swim. <laughs> Even the, all of the managers, some of the staff colleagues, they know how to swim. But most of the people, the elderly people, about 30 years old, the way, some of them, they don't know how to swim. You know? And what do the young ones learn how to swim? Uh, probably I'm talking about the young ones back in towns. Oh, in the towns. Yeah, in the towns. So there are some swimming pools there where okay. there are some trainers, you know, they will help them how to, the skills of swimming. Mm -hmm. and those and everything. But if you talk of maybe the local kids around local villages, around these areas, uh, they can play in water, but it's not really, really swimming, you know. Yeah. Sometimes uh, we get some incident where a, ch a child gets drowned in water, you know. Mm -hmm. So some of them, they don't know how to swim. Unless there's, a, there's a, uh, a special person who knows the skills of swimming and to train them. Mm -hmm. yeah. But kids in towns, cities, those are the people who knows how to do these things. But uh, talking about uh, my ankles, for example, give me an example. Ankles, they don't know how to swim. You know? Again, it depends on where you stay. In the towns, you'll find there are some pools, but uh, some areas, uh, the river will just flow just once, just a day, and it will be dry. You don't get some permanent waters like in the water, in the Okabama Delta here. Any question? All right. Now, folks, uh, I'm going to take you uh, back, you know, some million years back, you know, I'm talking about maybe uh, two million to six million years back. Mm -hmm. That was the time when the continent, we were joined together as one solid place, and it was used to be known as the Gondwana land, or the Pangea. So, now, because of the movements of the Earth, or the tectonic activities, and the crustal adjustment of the Earth, a lot of things get to change, you know. And uh, some of the continents get separated. And that was the time when this beautiful continent, which is Africa, was left there alone. You know? And that also, it, uh, it, yeah, it, uh, it helps into the, uh, into the formation of this uh, area because of those continents splitting away from one another. But like I'm talking now, it is still happening within the real continent of Africa. And uh, there is a major, major process happening within Africa and continent. Uh, it is known as the, the, the Great Rift Valley, you know. They reckon that the Great Rift Valley is splitting this continent into, into two or into halves, you know. And uh, they reckon that maybe the Great Rift Valley is going to affect this beautiful area, uh, which is at the Okavango Delta. So, well, it means the Great Rift Valley, it starts somewhere at the Gulf of Eden, passed through Kenya and Tanzania, uh, the Ngorongoro crater, and uh, it extends to Mozambique. But when it gets here, the record, it, it turns and headed more to the northern part of mm. our country, and it might affect this pristine area. So, and again, with this, <laughs> with this uh, <laughs> Great Rift Valley, like I'm saying, they say it's going to split this continent into two, and nobody knows at this moment, but uh, it is something that might, it might happen in 200 years you know, to come, or a million years to come, so, but nobody uh, knows at the moment. So most of the time, folks, with, this, uh, with those uh, tectonic activities, you know, or the traumas, or the sex, uh, sism uh, seismic uh, movements of the earth, most of the time, within the southern part, you don't feel those traumas, or those earth shaking, or the earthquakes. Uh, because of the, the Kalahari sand. So the Kalahari sand, it acts like a shock absorber. Mm. So the record that the Kalahari sand, it is something like 300 meters deep to 500 meters deep. Wow. So that's why we don't feel uh, Are those you earthquakes around. But yeah. some few, uh, last year, yeah, not few years, last year and this year, we felt some earthquakes and uh, they happened in, uh, in the same month, you know. Last year it happened around the uh, beginning of March and I didn't know about the readings of that earthquakes. 
Uh, this year it happened again, but it was measured in something like uh, 5.8 in a Richter scale. You know, so it started somewhere around uh, this uh, village known as Anzi and stretches all the way up all over the country. So that was two years back when we started to feel that you know we we, we do get some earthquakes around. But in fact, some years ago we didn't get uh, those kind of traumas around. Any question? No. Right. Now, folks, uh, I'm going to point at this area here. You see this part here? Just close to the Indian Ocean here. I'll say this area, it was the mouth of the Okabamo Delta. The reason why I'm saying that, uh, some, uh, some million years ago, we used to have those rivers that used to flow with aggression and speed and pass through our country, drain up with another country known as Proto Limpopo and empties up in the sea. But because of the tectonic activities, the movements of the of the earth, lots of those rivers they diverted because of lots of things. Uh, more to the southeast of our country, there was a major, major upliftment of the earth, known as the Kalahari Zimbabwe axis of uplift. So that was the main blockage of these rivers. And also to the north of this area, we did get lots of uh, or some series of fault lines that uh, diverted some of the rivers. Those rivers, folks, I'm talking about uh, Zambezi, Chode, and Okavango River. So they used to flow all the way from the highlands of Angola and meet somewhere in this grayish patch and continue and all the way and empties up in the sea. Mm. Now because of those major blockage, a uh, lot of things get to change in our country and also there was a lot of water that was trapped in this grayish patch during the time of uh, that blockage. So this area, it is, uh, it was used to known as one of the super giant lakes, known as uh, uh, Makadi Kadi or Kalahari Lake. You know, then what is left now? It is only a vast network of pens within this area. It's, it is no longer a lake, but it's a small pens around this area. It's a beautiful area that. If you want to, maybe if you are a birder, uh, you want to see lots, of, maybe lots of birds. This is the area that we get lots of migrants, you know, again, within this area. Uh, for example, one of the special sightings of birds, we're talking about those lesser flamingos and the greater flamingos. Uh, each and every summer time, our rainy season, they breed into this area and we get to see frogs and frogs of birds. And also, remember, that time when the water was trapped here, lots of sediments were brought into this area and lots of salts. And this is the area where our country now, they are doing some salt mines. Uh, somewhere not far from this area, you know, uh, they are mining some salts. You know. Any question? All right. Now, we want to know where our waters are coming from uh, within the Okapango Delta here. And, uh, Firstly, I'm going to talk about the rainfalls between, uh, within our country and regional rainfalls from Angola. Remember the waters from the, the waters that you see all the way from uh, the Okavango Delta Falls? It is the waters coming from the highlands of Angola, or the Planaltos of Angola, somewhere around this area. It is uh, a mountainous area, lots of mountains or hills. So it's more like an easy elevation for the water uh, to drain all the way within the drainage down to the to the to the south you know, towards our country. So there are two main rivers that supplies the Okavango Delta with water. The first river is here, it is known as Quito. And the second river is here, it is known as Kubango. Those are the only two rivers that supplies the Okavango Delta with uh, with water. But remember it I was saying we used to have this amazing and trouble uh, heading into our country. But because of the, the activities or the tectonic activities, trouble diverted northeasterly and uh, drained up with Zambezi and all the way. And now Zambezi is the only river that empties up in the sea. But now we left with this uh, beautiful pristine area, which is the Delta. Now we're talking about our rainforest. Folks, uh, Botswana is a semi arid country. We receive unreliable uh, rainfalls. You know, our rainfalls are very, very low. You know, we don't get too much rainfalls, which means our local rainfalls they don't contribute much into the Okavango Delta. 
But what contributes into the Okavango Delta is the regional rainfalls from the highlands of Angola. So in terms of sea level, we are almost 1,000 meters away from the sea level. And these guys, we're talking about something like maybe double, 2,000 meters away from sea level. So it's easy for the flow to get into our country. And now, in terms of millimeters with the rainfalls, here in Botswana, we're getting something like, uh, in the northern part only, somewhere around this area, Chobe and Okavango, we're getting something like 500 millimeters of rainfall each and every year. But down to our country, somewhere around this area, we're getting something less, which is almost 250 millimeters of rainfall, you know. So we, get, we don't get much of, the, uh, much of rainfall. But these guys, which is the Angolans, where we get lots of water from, these guys, they can get something like 1,200 millimeters to 2,000 millimeters of rainfall wow. each and wow. every year. The reason is that these guys, they are closer to the equatorial region, you know. This area is always raining. It is closer to the dotted line, which is the equatorial forest. So during the summertime, they get lots and lots of rainfalls. And folks, uh, it takes something like almost four to six months for the water to reach this area which is the Okavango Delta. Which means, during the dry time, that's when we see, we start to see the Okavango Delta being filled up with water, which means the water from the regional uh, rainfalls. During our rainfalls, our local rainfalls, it will, it will rain, but uh, we get less water. But most of the water, we get them from the, uh, from, from the, the regional rainfalls from Angola. And also, we, I mean, we in Botswana and the Angolans here, we get the rainfalls at the same time. That's why it takes something like six months, you know. So which means our summer time is around, uh, when, or let's say, when we say our rains are, are early, we say it's towards the end of October. October, November, it will be raining. December, January, it will be raining. February, it will be raining. And March, then the rain stops. And it will be, it will be the same in Angola again with the rainfalls and uh, around uh, 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 let's say towards uh, around uh, May, June, July the water is, the area here is, they are starting to be dry some of those seasonal flood plains they are starting to be dry and uh, again they will fill up with this water from the regional areas now we see the water but the delta uh, uh, having lots of water around yeah. I don't know if you, you get me Thanks, mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. Any question? Right. So, before taking another map, uh, I want to explain about this area, which is Caprip Strip, Namibia. So, this area, folks, uh, uh, it will take us to uh, back to history, the history of Southern Africa. So, remember some of the, the countries where British protectorate like us here in Botswana, and uh, some of the countries uh, were colonized by Germans. So for this area to be into, to come into being, it was all between the British and the, the Germans. So Namibia, uh, it was colonized by Germans. And uh, there was this gentleman, in, uh, gentleman known as Leo von Kaprip. So he was a German counselor, and Leo von Kaprip, uh, he wanted an access route to Tanzania because they were also colonizing Tanzania. So he wanted a shortcut route, but this area, uh, this country, it was a British country. Now they made a change, you know, because they say, they, they talk to the British that, you know what, because uh, let's give you the, the Zanzibar island, that's Germans, you know, let's give you the Zanzibar island, and uh, you give us a little protection of area to get into Zambezi. And uh, head to Tanzania because what they needed those Germans they needed a shortcut because for them to, to go around they were thinking is uh, the trip was going to be a long a long trip yeah. now they say oh give, uh, let's give you the Zanzibar island and they give us a little protrusion here so that we can get into uh, Zambezi river and access all the way you know <coughs> you have one Capriv he didn't know about the Victoria Falls so he gets into his his, his uh, uh, cars or Land Rovers and on the boat and all the way and when he gets here he was blocked by the Victoria Falls. The 
already they have traded everything. You have to return back and they drain up with the Atlantic Ocean and all the way mm. to, Zanzibar, to Tanzania, to Zanzibar Island. So the area remains uh, the Namibian side uh, till now. It is, it is still known as Capri Strip Namibia. So if you talk about the tribes living here and out here, uh, some of them are relatives close to Kasani there and into this area. Any question? <laughs> That's all right. You were going to point to some. Oh, uh, no. No, no. Um, going back to your uh, water in your country, yeah. it, is most of it uh, drinkable still? Exactly, yeah. All of the waters within the Okabongo Delta, we drink the waters here. You know, the record the water within the Delta is very, very clean and pure uh, because of the Piparas. We are in the edge of the Delta, but right in the middle of the Delta, we get that Piparas uh, that uh, most of the locals they use it for making uh, those mattresses, but you don't use it for papers. Uh, it acts like a filter. The color Harrison, it acts like a filter. Those grasses and the sedges, they reckon they act like a filter. So that's why the water is very, very clean. And it is, uh, it is recommendable uh, uh, to drink, you know, the waters of the Okamu Delta. But not for you. People who are staying here, we the locals, if I'm thirsty when we are on the drive, I can just go there and have a drink and it's fine with the water. Unless maybe for the coming years, maybe something happens in terms of maybe pollution. That's when uh, maybe we'll st maybe we'll stop to drink the waters of the Oka Delta. Thank you. Any questions? No. no. Anything to add? <laughs> no. You put <laughs> right. it so well. Yeah. yeah all right. Uh, now I'm gonna take another map. Happy? Happy. Right. So if you still want to see this map. Uh, we still have chance uh, after the talk or later in the evenings or even tomorrow morning before we head out. Now I've brought a real map uh, that shows uh, how the real Okabongo Delta looks like. The beautiful, uh, with the aerial map that was shot. So, folks, uh, uh, what makes me happy about this pristine area? A lot of people are visiting this area and when they leave this area, they leave it or they, they give it some names or they leave some names behind. Some of the, I'm talking about the people like you, yeah? the photographers, you know, or the travelers, filmmakers, you know, even those hunters. Uh, the time when hunter, uh, hunting was still allowed in our country. So when they leave this country, they will leave it with a beautiful name or an interesting uh, name. Some of the people, they call this an oasis. Some they say it's a paradise. Uh. Some they say it's a wetland and no wonder. Some they call it the Okavango Delta. But the real name, uh, it is the al alluvial fen. It is known as the alluvial fen. Alluvial. Like A A, -A L L U V I E L alluvial fen. Yeah, it is known as the alluvial fen. And folks, I know that somewhere on the line, we're going to Zambia, we're going to Zimbabwe, South Africa again. Maybe at the end, we'll be heading back home. And when we get there, we'll be interested in to teach your your grandson, your sons and daughters about how the Okabongo looks like. You know. You still, you don't need a map again to describe this pristine area, you know. You can still use your hand. So the Okavango Delta, uh, or this alluvial fen, it is divided into three uh, major components, you know. The first component is the, the sea, starting from here to here. That is the first component uh, known as the, the pen handle. Remember this thing is looks like a, a pen, eh? mm -hmm. so the first com component is the pen handle, talking about this area. This area is the river Okavango. It is very, very deep and the current of water is very, very strong. Really? The channel is deep. So when the water gets here, we'll talk about those things later. So when it, the, the water gets here, it starts to split with different channels, right? Then it gets into the second component. The water gets into the second component. Here, the second component, we're talking about the, the, the permanent swamps or the permanent channels, like the area where we have been, uh, we have been doing the Mokoro in the morning there. Then the third component, 
we're talking about the seasonal swamps or seasonal floodplains, like the area in front of the camp. So, which means when the panhandle overflows, it feeds the permanent swamp with water. When the permanent swamps overflows, they feed the seasonal floodplains with water. So, this is how it works. So, when you get home, you don't need this map to describe the, the delta. You can still use your hand. It's an easy way of describe, uh, describing the Okavango Delta. So, to my shoulder here, this is the highlands or the Planalto of Angola, where we get the water, where the delta gets the water or the source of the water. From here to here is those two rivers, the Quito and the Kubango. So, this is uh, the two rivers that supplies the Okavango River with water. From here to here is the major channel, or which is the Okavango River. So when the water gets here, it's more like here. Eh? Mm -hmm. When the water gets here, it splits up with different channels. My fingers, they represent the permanent swamps or permanent channels. Between my fingers, those are the seasonal flood plains. So this is how easily you can describe the Okabongo Delta. Now back to the map. For you to see those uh, permanent swamps, you're looking at this area. The dark, the dark blue areas, those are the permanent swamps within the Okavango Delta in the map. And the seasonal flower plants, the light blue color there, those uh, are the seasonal flower plants around the Delta. So folks, uh, we are here in this area. This is where we are. We are right in the edge of the Okavango Delta. Even though yesterday we did cover some grounds trying to search and search for those elusive uh, impalas, <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, we were circling around somewhere around this area, but we were covering some grounds. We were far away from the camp, but we were circling somewhere around here. This area is very, very huge. You know, folks, uh, it, uh, it comprises of something like 18,000 square kilometers. You know, wow. it's very, very huge. For you to start from this point to this point here, I think maybe it's going to take you a day or two days, unless if you travel during the night time again. But uh, you have to go around. Using this kind of gifts, you have to go around, you know, all the way to get uh, through to this area. It's a huge area because right in the middle of the delta, there are some deep channels, you know, deep permanent channels that there are some camps in, and those guys they are using speedboats. This is where there are some camps in the middle, but people there they are using speedboats. That's why they have uh, uh, they have introduced those uh, uh, white-breasted cisnas. Oh, to yeah. take people from one area to yeah. another. Talking about the, the airplanes, 206, yeah. 208, to uh, take people from different destinations to another. So the area is huge and it's deep. So I'm still going to talk about uh, the Delta again because uh, during the time of tectonic movement of the plates, there were some series of fortresses that happened within this uh, pristine area. You know? So we have several fortresses within the Okavango Delta. And remember, folks, the Okavango Delta, again, it links up with the Chobe River there. There's a channel known as Cylinder Spillway around here. You see this area? It connects up with Chobe. So when the Delta overflows, it feeds the Chobe River with water. And Chobe feeds up the, uh, the Zambezi all the way to the Indian Ocean. And again, when the Delta overflows, it feeds that area, remember that area that I was saying is the super gent lake, uh, Makadi Kadi, that grayish patch on the other map, it, the delta can connect up with that area, those pens, uh, the Makadi Kadi pens. And again, when it overflows, it feeds this blue area. This is uh, one of the major lakes, again, within Botswana. It is known as Lake Ingabi. You know, I'll talk about Lake Ingabi later. So, uh, with the fault lines within the delta, I'm going to put uh, some few fault lines within this area. So the first fault lines, they are known as the panhandle fault lines. Here are the, the panhandle fault lines around this area. And now when we get, the water gets here, it meets up with another fault line known as uh, Gumare fault line. It was named after one of the small village known as Gumare here. So this fault line, folks, it is more like the Victoria Falls. But now because our country is flat, it's hard for you to see water going down you know it's a mm. flat area like the water will go but it's hard to see it with your your eyes 
At the bottom, there's another fault line known as Tamalakani fault line. So this fault line and this fault line are known as the twin faults. And now, what happens to the middle of the delta? The area in the middle collapses down, like a grab and fault. You know, that's why the water starts to slow down and splits up with different tunnels. So it's more like a, a basin, eh? mm. yeah, it's more like kind of a basin. But again in the middle there, there was, uh, because of those tectonic uh, activities, there was a major, major island that uplifted in the middle of the delta. It is known as Chiefs Island, right in the middle here of the Kabamo Delta. This Chiefs Island, folks, uh, I don't know if it's Bob, uh, somebody was asking about the rhinos. This is the area where those beautiful species talking about the white rhinos and the, the black rhino, they have been reintroduced back into the wilderness in Botswana. So this is the only area where you get to see those rhinos. They reintroduced them around 2001. It was a joint venture between Botswana government, wilderness safari company, and also Department of Wildlife and National Parks. And they come up with an idea of taking the, those uh, beautiful species into this area. Because those, the rhinos in Botswana folks, they nearly went into extinction, mm -hmm. you know. Then they decided to put them back into the wellness. They do have a checking device within the horn. Uh, they, 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 they track them through the horn. They add something there. I don't know what, uh, what it is called, but uh, one of my colleagues is working there. And uh, I always ask him about the numbers of rhinos in this area. He, he doesn't tell me the exact number. Always I ask him, he says, the rhinos are doing well in this area. I ask him, why, why don't you tell me the numbers? He said, no, it's all about the poaching problem, you know. Uh, so they don't want to give the numbers out to the public because of the poaching. So they are, they are withholding the numbers around. So the reason why they brought them, the area is more secured. It's right in the middle of the delta. It's hard for the poachers to come in. But imagine if uh, they decided to introduce those rhinos in Chobe National Park. It would be an easy movement for them to cross the Chobe River to the other side. And lots of pushing activity happens around the borderlines there. You know, so that's why they brought them here. Besides this area, the area again in Botswana where you can see the rhinos, it is somewhere in the central part of the country. There's an area known as Kama Sanctuary. It, was, it is named after our president, eh? Kama, Kama families. So it's a, that area, that one is, is a fence area, and there's, there are some rhinos in. But here there's no fences around. But the only, the only thing they, they're trying to control the movement of those rhinos is all about the anti poaching unit guys, the military guys around this area, the Department of Wildlife and National Parks around this area. So they are, they are looking at the movement of, the, of those animals around. So they have reintroduced them around 2001 and they brought two, two females white rhinos and the two male white rhinos. And one of the females, she was pregnant after some months to drop the young ones. They went to Zimbabwe uh, from uh, where the brother from another mother came from. <laughs> Blessing. They went there for, to ask for black rhinos and they managed to get them and uh, they brought them here. 2003 again, they went back to South Africa to ask for more uh, white rhinos. And that one it was with an exchange with the sable antelopes. So South Africa, they don't have much of the sable antelopes. So there were some sables that were caught into these areas and they were they, they were taken to South Africa and they, it was an exchange with the rhinos. This year, recently, I think it was some few weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, uh, they went to South Africa again and they brought an, another, other, other rhinos, uh, which, are, which are white rhinos again. But they didn't uh, brought them here. They brought them somewhere around this area, known as uh, Chitabe area. So, which means rhinos are coming back into our our country. Good. Yeah. Any questions? Do y'all uh, have any camps in that place? In that place? Yeah. It's a, it's a game reserve. The government only allows two camps to operate within this area. One of the camp is wellness camp, known as Mombo. Another one is uh, Chiefs Camp. It's a different company. So only two camps operate within this area. Well, I just wanted to mention that uh, <clears throat> yeah. the 
price for one night at the classic camps, wilderness classic camps in that area. Probably the price you paid for this tour is the price for one night in those camps. So the difference is all about the prices. Yeah. It's, uh, classic camps and uh, those uh, premium camps. So, yeah. but in terms of animal folks, uh, you just see the same animals. <laughs> the same animals that we've seen here, you still see them. The, uh, except for the Brains. rhinos. We haven't seen the rhinos, but if you talk about leopards, uh, lions, you still see them there, you still see lions here. So it's all about the, the prices and also the premium camps and classic camps like he have just mentioned. Any question? Right. Now, uh, talking about this area, folks, uh, which is Lake Ngami. Lake Ngami, folks, it was it's a beautiful area. It's a big lake that, you know, as a photographer again, it's an area that you might, if you want to visit it, you can visit it. It is closer to Mao. Uh, the, the Mao is the town here. Uh, and it's a town which is the, the entrance to the Okavango Delta. So, if you like a bad life, it's one of the areas that you visit, you know. Lots of migrants, you know, talking about those common bee eaters, uh, the yellow bear kites, step eagles, they all migrate from those uh, Europe countries, uh, North Africa, and they breed into this area. So again, this area, it is an area where you get to see the fishermen. But uh, the problem with the fishermen in this area, so a few years ago, fishermen, they were catching, they were allowed, everybody was allowed to catch fish here. But the problem was that the fishermen, they were catching lots of fish and they, even the small ones, you know. And those small ones, tiny little ones that they don't need, they will throw them out. Instead of throwing them back into the water, they will throw them on the outskirts of the lake. And uh, the area started to smell bad. That uh, the government uh, started to emphasize some laws, you know. And he managed to fence this area. And if you are a fisherman, for you to go in, you have to have a fishing license. You know, and there are some guys who are working at the gates there. And also, as a bedder, a bedder is fine. If you are a photographer, you just go freely, take your pictures, enjoy, and head out again. But fishermen, there are some, there are some, uh, some restrictions uh, within this area for them. Nobody is allowed to go in and try to fish without a fishing license. Any question? Question. Now, we have a delta at the mouth at the end of the Mississippi River. Yeah. Now, one of the problems we have is it fills in. The, the river itself fills in with all the sediment washing down the river. And we always continuously dredging and making deeper so that the water continues. Yeah. Do y'all do anything like that? Uh, nope. So, it, so this thing can change naturally. Exactly. So if it... I see this is all sand, so this is all coming out the desert somewhere. Exactly, yeah. So it can build up and change course. Exactly. Okay. You're right, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now see, and ours is dug that way, uh -huh. mainly for shipping. Oh. Okay, we yeah. got to get the ships up the river. Yeah. Yeah, but here, you don't do anything. It's a natural okay. thing. So again, folks, remember this. This is the only Indian Delta around the whole world. Yeah. 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 Any questions? before we get into the threads quickly. All right, now, oh, a question before we get to the thread. Folks, where do you think this waters goes to? All the waters that? The plants, uh -huh. evaporation, uh -huh. people. Uh -huh. You're right, Bob. <laughs> so that's who uses, that's who uses, and the animals use water. Yeah, I'll give you one. Who uses water. Yeah, I'll give you five out of five. So folks, like Bob is saying, uh, it's, it's true. Uh, the record that uh, within the hundred percent of the waters of the Okavango Delta, ninety-five percent of the water evaporates through evapotranspiration through those open bodies and through plants. You know. We, lo we lose a lot of water in the delta, 95% of the water. And then we're remaining with the 5% of the water. 3% of the water, it seeps as underground water. 2%, the record is the water that you see all over there, down to Mao. That is the remaining 2%. So, lot of water evaporates through, yeah, evapotranspiration and uh, uh, because of too much heat around this country, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Now to the threats. Again, a question. Folks, we have been driving around. You have almost uh, two, three nights here. And we have been driving with me and Muamo. Maybe you have realized that something, it might be a threat to the Delta. And uh, before I, I, I mention out some of the threats, I want to, to hear from you. Bob, why do you think it might be a threat to this Princeton area? I, don't, I haven't seen any, but uh, agriculture, people planting, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, large commercial, big farms. farms. I'm not talking yeah. about the little farmer. Yeah, you are right. talking about the, some hectares and hectares. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So, it might be, even though we haven't, uh, people haven't yet started anything, but if in some coming years, if something, some people started to do that, it might be one of the threats within the local, I mean, uh, we're talking about the local people around. Anybody? I was thinking, since the water comes from the rivers in Angola, if Angola starts to pollute or, or do agriculture, won't it come down sure. into your delta? That is one of the threats that is happening like now, you're right. And you so, don't have control over Angola. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, somewhere on the line, Angola uh, was under some political stability, instabilities. Yeah? But now uh, things are going down, and uh, it's one of our the study countries around Southern African Development uh, Committees is one of them. But uh, like your point, say people around those rivers, the Quito and the Kubango in Angola, and also. Capri Strip, Namibia here. Those guys are doing some big farms, like we say. And each and every year, they are throwing some pesticides and uh, insecticides, and the rains will come, wash away everything into the drainage, and uh, lots of things are deposited into this area. Right, it's one of the threats. But uh, I think it's two years back, uh, last year, they were talking about these people uh, to move them from these rivers and uh, to build some wells where they will get water to do, to irrigate their crops and everything. And they will leave these rivers freely. So, but maybe they are still on the plans to do that. One other threat uh, that faced the Okavango Delta, it was the neighboring country again, Namibia. The Namibians, some years ago, they wanted to divert this water from this river, which is Kavango, and uh, to generate the hydroelectric power station. You know, likely uh, that time the Delta was listed as one of the water heritage sites. You know, and again it is protected by one of the organizations known as the the Ramza Convention. It was formed in Iran in 1971. Uh, it protects all the wetlands around the whole world. You know, so likely these guys they went into some court cases until at the end they, they lost the cases, and now. They are quiet. So now you're out of light. <laughs> 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 yeah. Otherwise, if they've diverted the, the water, a lot of things will suffer. Yeah. Another thing, uh, littering. Uh, that's why, with our company, we have uh, introduced those uh, brown bags to throw the tissues and everything and take them back into the camp. And these things, those papers, they don't belong here. They belong somewhere in the towns. There are some trucks that will come in around camps collect uh, those uh, papers and pack for recycling and cans. But otherwise, if you don't take care of this area, throw litter everywhere, we're killing the, the whole system of the Okabongo Delta. Nobody would like to come around this area because it will, it will be, you know, you know, lots of uh, plastics and everything around. One other thing, uh, thinking about the jeeps, the Land Rovers, uh, that operates within the Delta. So if these Land Rovers they have some leakages, you know, oil leakages, and we cross the waters. It's more like water pollution again. You know, some of the species they don't need oils from the leakages of the Land Rovers. It might be a threat. Uh, another threat we have an invasive weed within the Delta here. It is known as the the Salvania molester or the Cariba weed. So the Cariba weed, the record, it comes somewhere from Brazil. That's where they think it comes from. How it comes here? The thing comes up with the migrant, the birds, you know, and back into the drain and it is deposited into the delta. We have a trouble with a, a beetle that's mm -hmm. got into our delta and it's killing all the grass. Is it? Why do yeah. you call that beetle? I don't know. Uh, they, it's fairly new. They, they've 
just been working on it within like the last two years. Oh, okay. And you can just go see brown spots. <laughs> you know, just acres of them. Exactly. So, yeah. That with folks, it blocks up the channels. Or sometimes someone on the line, it will, it will choke up this area. Because uh, it, blocks, it blocks those channels totally, you know. So, there was a gentleman, I uh, forgot his name, he was from Australia. So the gentleman tried to help uh, Botswana. Uh, what he did, he, he breathed an insect known as snouted weevil. So the insect was feeding on the molester. But the problem was that, if you talk of the delta, you're talking about an area with lots of, and lots of uh, bird species, you know. So the birds were feeding on the insects. So it didn't work. So we still find, we still see the weed around. And the government tried to hire some locals around, like people from those small villages, and uh, to collect it. Because the only way to eradicate it is to collect it, pile it somewhere, leave it to dry, and come back and burn it again. So now the government realized that he is putting the, the life of the, the local people in danger. Lots of hippos, lots of crocodiles, leeches, waterborne diseases, you know, but it didn't work again. So now to try to control it, what they're doing now, there is a department of water affairs. They will come around the camps, ask people around camp, where do you find the weed? We show them, they go there, collect it, pile it, and they will come back and burn it. Because that weed, folks, uh, you take it from the water and you drop it here. At the time when the water comes and fills these areas, it, is, it starts to be alive again. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem with, the, with that uh, Sylvania molester. Another uh, threat, uh, talking about global warming, too much evaporation, too much heat in the country. So that is, it might be one of the, the threats. Any threat, Mukula, that you think, Siri? <coughs> Me? <laughs> how? <laughs> how, about, how about war between the countries? This, yeah. could, this could be a prize. The diamonds could be a prize if another exactly. country wants it. Yeah, if it happens, do y'all have, have an army? We have an army. Okay. Yeah, around the country, a lot of those countries around Southern Africa they have a uh, military thing or the armies. But if it happens, there's war. Well, oh, that could affect the tremendous. A lot of things yeah. will be affected in these areas. You know, even our wildlife animals, not only the delta, even the animals around oh, yeah. the area, yeah. they will be affected. Yeah. Right now, folks, quickly, uh, let's head to the. The engineers of the Delta, uh, the, uh, the, engine, the ecosystem engineers of the Delta, uh, those are the things that make this uh, that make this area more beautiful, yeah? or change this area in a way, in a certain way. Um, firstly, I'm going to talk about these elephants. Oh, I'll ask you, folks, you have been driving around, right? And uh, you have seen those broken trees all over around, but it's all about the elephants, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think? Those elephants, they are doing it right to break the trees, or are they destroying the environment? I don't want to point at Bob. Joe! <laughs> 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 anybody? Okay, anybody. No, I'm joking. No, I, don't, I don't think they hurt the environment. It's part of the environment. Exactly. It's their environment. Yeah, it's, it's nature. It's nature. For hundreds okay. of years. Well, it helps, to, it helps to feed the young the way they're the way they push the trees down toward the ground so that they can exactly. populate. Yeah. The reason why I'm asking this question, the previous group, I asked them the same question and one of the ladies said, you know what tips this elephant that destroying these areas? <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> so the elephants folks, for them to break these trees down, they are doing it right, you know, and they are helping other species. And firstly, they are converting the woodland into the savanna. And again, they are helping the termites. Remember mm. those termites? They feed on dead materials. They feed on dead wood. You know? Those wood, fallen wood on the grounds. So for them to push the trees down, they are opening up these areas you know, for other uh, species. And also, they are helping the termites. So they are doing it right. They are one of the, the keystone species of the Okavango Delta. They make this area more and more beautiful. Yeah, but could at one time they be overpopulated? Too many elephants? Uh-huh. What's uh, the name of termites? 
Let's see, this one comes to you. What do you think about the numbers of the elephants oh, within this country? Do we have a lot of elephants or...? Yes, we do. Um, you actually find that when you visit the Chobe National Park mm -hmm. in October when everything is bone dry and you realize the damage that they're doing to the environment. Exactly. So which you got yeah exactly. yeah so when we talk about poaching then we'll get into that yeah, yeah. yeah. so I'm, I'm gonna ask another question uh, okay uh, you. i'm gonna ask you bless you. Uh -huh. so during the rainy times mm -hmm. you come around this area even chobe i think so mm -hmm. you've been to chobe during the rainy time right yeah when it's green how many elephants do you see during the, the rainy times not uh, many and that time where they have gone? Where did they go? They just spread out. They don't have far to go to for food or water. Uh -huh. they, they stay in the same areas. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That was the question that I was asking myself the whole time, you know. Because you come here during the rainy time. You can drive for two weeks, folks, without just one elephant. Two weeks. And when somebody sees an elephant here, it's a special sighting. We get to see lots of vehicles running towards one elephant. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right. So, yeah, let's continue, folks. Uh, uh, one of the engineers talking about the termites. So, the termites, they say, uh, uh, they make this area more unique again uh, because the termites, they help into the creation of those small islands around the delta. It's all about uh, the, the termites here. <coughs> and uh, because of those islands, for, uh, for them to be there, then life comes around those islands. Talking about plants, trees, grasses, and everything <coughs> around the, those islands. And they reckon that without the termites or those fungus growers, termites or the microtermites, the delta will never be like this. You know, they reckon it will be maybe a body of water with no life. Mm. Wow. Because of those uh, uh, small creatures, those termites, they are helping into the creation of those islands. And now we have hippos. Remember folks, hippos they walk and we have been seeing the hippo highways. <coughs> hippo highways. Those hippo highways, those are the things that make this area more dynamic. Remember the delta is dynamic. It's keep, it, it keeps on changing each and every year. So when the inflow comes, find a hippo highway. The water divert with that hippo highway, access the area that haven't accessed by water before because of those hippo trains. Mm. And also hippos, they walk in the water, they push the sand. Wherever the channel is getting blocked, they push the, because they are walking, walking around and the water will flow easily <laughs> and access mm -hmm. those other areas, you know. Natural we have bees yeah. and, uh, yeah, bees. Bees, they help in, the, in terms of pollination of flowers during the summertime. You, get, you come here during the summertime rainy season, you get to see lots of flowers here. The hibiscus flowers, the daisy families, pavonias, you know. So the bees, they help into pollination of those things like flowers. Then we have primates and birds. I'm talking about my cousins, baboons and birds. They help in, to, uh, in, uh, in uh, yeah, they help in the in the deposition of seeds, yeah, because uh, they they eat on those berries and uh, fruits. Then they move from one place to another and they replant by pooping. They poop with the seed, they replant another tree, you know. So they are playing a major important role. Now we have a fire, we need a fire, a controlled fire, not a deliberate fire where maybe for example Mukula is driving his Land Rover there, utility vehicle, smoking, mm -hmm. throwing that cigarette butt, oh. and the fire catches, and uh, you know he's not smoking. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't need those kind of fires, we need a controlled fires, so there are some wildlife management uh, guys, or wildlife management areas, where the Department of uh, Wildlife and National Parks, they will burn a certain area and stop the fire. Because they know that after fire, the fire returns back the nutrients into the soil. And uh, after that after that fire, there are some new grass uh, shoots that are coming out. And those animals, they need those kind of grasses again. They're very, very palatable to them. Any questions before heading more to the interesting facts? Before we run out of time. Now the interesting facts, folks. Uh, I'm gonna. Those are the. I'm gonna give you the numbers of animals within the delta. Talking about mammals, reptiles, birds, <coughs> plants, insects, fish. Yeah, those six. 
I will start with the mamas. Within the Okavango Delta, just only the Okavango, not, Cho not Chobe, I'm talking about this area, folks. Uh, within the Okavango Delta, the numbers of mammals, the reckon that we have something like uh, 164 mm. species of mammals within this area. The reptiles, they are talking of something like uh, between 52 and 54 species of <laughs> reptiles within the Okavango. Fish life, they're talking about 73 species of fish. Then, uh, what else? Birds, they're talking about over 400 species of birds wow. within the Okavango. Plants, they're talking of something like 1,300 species of plants within the Delta. Lastly, which is uh, which are the insects, they're talking of over 5,000 insects <coughs> around the Delta. That's amazing. Folks, uh, I'm gonna stop here. So, folks, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So, if you are amazing. I'm still in the vehicle. Blessing is still there. Moamo is still there. Mkula, TD, during the dinner later. I'm still, uh, we're still here for you. Thank you so much. Hey. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> like from yeah. the engineers, it's the two biggest animals, elephants and hippos, and the two smallest. Oh. For now, you may be filling up your water bottles, use the bathroom. Yes. Awesome. Yes. Yes.